We are all looking to save money. So what if I told you there's a really easy way to do so by shopping online like you normally do? With TopCashBack.com, you can save big at more than 4,000 popular online stores. Target, Amazon, Groupon, and more. Just sign up free at TopCashBack.com slash grammar. Find the store you want and click through to its site. Then shop as normal and you'll automatically earn cash back in your Top Cash Back account. For my listeners, there's even a special bonus. Sign up now at topcashback.com slash grammar, and you can earn a $10 sign-up bonus. Remember, that's topcashback.com slash grammar. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and this week I have a super meaty middle by Neil Whitman about the origin of English and other languages and how they're all tied together. If you ever studied Latin or Greek word roots in your middle school or high school English classes, you may have wondered why English words are so different from Latin or Greek roots. For example, the Latin root for the word tooth is dent, as in dentist. The Greek root is odont, as in orthodontist. But the English word, of course, is tooth. Here's another one. The Latin root for foot is ped, as in pedestrian or pedestal. The Greek root is pod or pod, as in podiatrist. But instead of a word containing P and D, English just has foot. On the other hand, sometimes an English word is a lot like the equivalent root in Latin or Greek. For example, the Latin word for mother is mater, and Greek is mater. And they both resemble the English word, starting with M, with a T in the middle, and an R at the end. What's going on with this mix of similarities and differences? The answer is that Latin, Greek, and English are all related. But Latin and Greek are more closely related to each other than they are to English. In fact, all three of these languages, and many others as well, are part of a single language family called the Indo-European languages. And they all ultimately trace back to a single ancestral language, which was spoken centuries before writing was invented. We don't know what speakers of that language called it, but today it's known as Proto-Indo-European. A reasonable question is how can we possibly know that this language existed? To get an idea of how linguists reconstruct earlier forms of a language— Let's look at one of the major subfamilies within the Indo-European family, the Romance languages. These include the modern-day national languages of Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, and Romanian, as well as languages that don't have a nation-state of their own, such as Occitan and Catalan, which you may have been hearing about recently as citizens of the Spanish region of Catalonia have pushed for independence. These languages all developed from Latin, but let's pretend for a moment that we don't know that. We can still get a pretty good idea of what their ancestral language sounded like if we have enough words in the modern languages that we think might have a common origin. Let's take the words for mother and father, for example. In Portuguese, they're my and pai. In Spanish and Italian, they're madre and padre, And in French, they're mère and père. Let's focus just on the word for mother at this point. We can be sure that the ancestral word began with M, because all the modern equivalents do. We can also be sure that the ancestral word had an R in it, because three out of the four modern equivalents do, the words in Spanish, Italian, and French. Next, we can be pretty confident that the ancestral word had a D between the M and the R, since the Spanish and Italian words do. You might be wondering at this point, how can we be so sure since the other two languages, Portuguese and French, don't have a D in their words for mother? The reason is that certain kinds of sound changes are more likely to happen over time. For a DR cluster, to lose the D is a simplification, a natural kind of change. On the other hand, to insert a D before an R is a complication and a less common kind of change. So in the absence of further evidence, we conclude that the ancestral word for mother for these languages had a DR cluster and that two of those languages simplified it. Now, what about the vowels? 
The first vowel was most likely a, ah, since that's what we have in Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian. The second vowel was most likely a, since that's the one that appears more than any other. So the ancestral word was probably similar to the modern Spanish and Italian words, madre. Similar reasoning lets us conclude that the ancestral word for father was padre. Of course, we don't have to go to all that trouble because we know from written history that all the places in Europe where these languages were originally spoken were part of the Roman Empire, and that Latin was the language spoken across the empire. That's actually why they're called Romance languages, because they were spoken in the Roman Empire. In fact, we know from written documents that the Latin word for mother actually had a T in the middle instead of a D. It's mater, remember? But now we can conclude that somewhere along the way, from Latin to its daughter languages, that T turned into a D. However, the surprising thing about the techniques for reconstructing ancestral languages is that they can work even when we don't have written records of the ancestral language. How is that even possible? Well, more on that after a quick break for our sponsor. Have you walked by a newsstand and seen a stunning magazine cover that makes you want to stop and peek inside? Or read a cover headline that makes you need to know more? Next time you do, remember Texture. With the Texture app, not only do you get a peek, you get the whole magazine, plus unlimited access to more than 200 additional premium titles, like Time, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, and Wired. And right now, you can try Texture free. Just imagine having your favorite magazines and their back issues anytime, anywhere. To start your Texture free trial, go to texture.com slash grammar. If you choose to continue, podcast listeners will get Texture for just $9.99 a month. That's more than 30% off their listed price. There are also great gift options available for the holiday season. Go to texture.com slash grammar to start your free trial today. That's texture.com slash grammar. Texture.com slash grammar. And now back to Proto-Indo-European and how we know whether the reconstructed words are real. It's one thing to reconstruct ancient words when you have written texts that can confirm your reconstructions, as Latin texts can do for the Romance languages. But how can linguists know that their reconstructed words in Proto-Indo-European are anything close to reality? Well, in many cases, they disagree. For example, they still haven't agreed on a precise reconstruction of the Proto-Indo-European word for horse, even though it's clear that Proto-Indo-European had such a word. However, a striking and unexpected discovery in the early 20th century gives linguists confidence in the method. In 1879, the linguist Ferdinand de Saussure was reconstructing a set of verbs in Proto-Indo-European that formed different tenses by using a process called ablaut. We actually have ablaut in English, with verbs that change their vowels, such as sing, sang, sung, and write, wrote, written. Anyway, de Saussure found that he could collapse two families of Proto-Indo-European ablaut verbs into a single family— if he assumed that there used to be a consonant in a certain position in some of these verbs. Unfortunately, whatever this consonant was, it didn't exist in any of the known Indo-European languages. His analysis didn't go over well at all, especially since he actually proposed not just one hypothetical mystery consonant, but two of them. Some reconstructed verbs had one, and some had the other. If he could do that in his reconstructions, what couldn't he propose? Had de Saussure not died in 1913, he might have had the last laugh. Two years after his death, Bedrick Hrozny deciphered the writing system for Hittite, the language spoken almost four millennia ago in what is now Turkey. And it turns out that Hittite was an Indo-European language, nearly the oldest one to have been written. Moreover, it was later shown that Hittite verbs had consonants exactly where de Saussure had put them, confirming his outlandish reconstructions. We still don't know, though, exactly what those consonants sounded like. The discovery of the Indo-European language family happened a century before de Saussure proposed his mystery consonants, and maybe even earlier, depending on whom you believe. 
the story of its discovery is famous among linguists. Like most famous stories, it's not entirely true, but we'll start with the popular version. It begins with Sir William Jones, a British judge in Calcutta, India, in the late 1700s, who knew a lot of languages. In particular, he knew Latin and Greek, having had a classical education in England, and he had also learned the ancient Indian language Sanskrit, because that was the official language in the courts he'd be working in. During his years in India, he gave an annual talk to a club he helped found called the Royal Asiatic Society. In the third of these annual talks, he discussed the origin and history of the people of India, and in one famous passage talked about a common ancestral language for Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. He said that the Sanskrit language was so similar to Latin and Greek that in his words, quote, no philologer could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists, unquote. A philologer, in case you're wondering, is someone who studies language in its written form. And in fact, Jones's remarks about Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit have become known as the philologer passage. The philologer passage is usually credited with kicking off a century of research and discoveries, showing that not only were Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit linguistic cousins to each other, but also that many other languages originating in Europe, Asia Minor, and the Indian subcontinent were in that same family. This geographic distribution is what gave this family of languages its name, with Indo coming from Indios, the Greek word for India. To get an idea what Jones was talking about, let's take our example of the words for mother and father again. Remember that the Latin word for mother is mater, and the ancient Greek is mater. In Sanskrit, the word is mater. The Latin word for father is pater, in ancient Greek it's pater, and in Sanskrit it's piter. Many other such similarities can be found. So, how does English fit into this picture? English is a member of the Germanic language subfamily, which also includes Swedish, Norwegian, Icelandic, and German, as well as Gothic, a language that was last spoken more than a thousand years ago. One of the main changes that distinguish Germanic languages from other Indo-European languages is a pattern known as Grimm's Law. It's named after Jacob Grimm, who was one of the Brothers Grimm, famous for their collection of European folk tales. But he was also a philologer, and in the 1820s he published a grammar of German. And in that grammar, he described a pattern of several systemic sound changes that happened in the dialect of Proto-Indo-European that eventually became Proto-Germanic. This is another language that was never written, but it's the language from which all our modern Germanic languages developed. One of those changes involved the sounds P, T, and K, and in particular, we're interested in the P sound. As the Proto-Germanic language began to split off from Proto-Indo-European, its speakers began to pronounce P as F. So while the Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit words for father begin with P, the word in English and other Germanic languages begins with an F sound. In German, it's Vater. In Swedish, it's Far. And in Gothic, it's Vader. This P to F sound didn't just affect the Proto-Indo-European word for father. One of the amazing discoveries that early historical linguists made is that sound changes eventually affect every word that has the relevant sound. That's why English has the word fish, where Latin has piscis, fire, where ancient Greek has pyre, and foot, where Latin has ped and Greek has pod. In addition to the Germanic subfamily, Some other main subfamilies of Indo-European are the Celtic languages, including Welsh, Irish, and Scots Gaelic. The Slavic languages, such as Russian, Ukrainian, Serbian, Croatian, and Macedonian. And the Indo-Iranian languages, which include Persian, Dari, and Pashto, as well as Sanskrit and all of its descendant languages, such as Hindi, Bengali, and Nepali. With such a wide geographic range of Indo-European languages, It's natural to wonder where the original speakers of Proto-Indo-European lived. 
This isn't entirely settled, but the most widely believed scenario is that they lived about 5,000 years ago in the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, in the present-day region of Russia that lies between Ukraine to the west and Kazakhstan to the east. Some of the words that have been reconstructed in Proto-Indo-European tell us a bit about these people's culture. For example, they must have used wheels because several Indo-European languages have a word for wheel or circle that allow us to reconstruct a Proto-Indo-European word for it. In Old English, our word wheel was huegel. If you run that through Grimm's Law and the other known sound changes in reverse, you arrive at kweklos as the Proto-Indo-European word. In Greek, this word developed into the word kuklos, which you might recognize as the Greek root that we pronounce as cycle. In Latin, it shows up as circus, or as it would have been pronounced in classical Latin, kirkus. The Proto-Indo-European word kwekalos is even the source of the Sanskrit word for wheel, chakra, which we've borrowed into English as a piece of yoga-related vocabulary, along with the word yoga, too. I said earlier that the story of William Jones and the discovery of Proto-Indo-European wasn't entirely true. In an article published in 2006, linguist Lyle Campbell pointed out several problems with the story. First of all, Jones incorrectly classified several languages, such as Arabic, as Indo-European languages. Furthermore, he didn't classify several other languages as Indo-European that some of his contemporaries correctly did, such as the Slavic and Germanic languages. Not only that, but even for some of the languages that he did correctly include, his reasoning was unsound and not acceptable in modern linguistics. And finally, he wasn't even the first one to propose a common ancestral language for Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit. That idea had been around for at least 100 years. And the relationship between these languages really is so obvious that it didn't require modern comparative linguistic techniques to make the call. Even so, in the more than 200 years since Jones's remarks, the comparative method has helped establish not only the Indo-European family of languages, but many other language families of the world, too. That segment was written by Neil Whitman, who blogs about linguistics at literalminded.wordpress.com. Thanks to everyone who left reviews recently and told me where they listen. Bimal Bonho teaches ESL in South Korea and listens while commuting. A.H. Johnstone is a freelance editor in the U.K. and listens while walking back from dropping the kids at school. Also, thanks to Arla Maldo, who left a review at iTunes, and Dewey Wagner, who reviewed my tip-a-day calendar, The Grammar Daily, on Amazon. I really appreciate all the reviews. Thank you. Also, I've been trying to do more on Instagram lately. My account there is The Grammar Girl. I did my first Instagram Live video last week, and it wasn't a complete disaster, so I might do one again. I'm not saying I will, but I might. So if you want to interact with me that way, you might want to follow me on Instagram, The Grammar Girl. Great pitch, right? You totally want to follow me now that you know it's not a complete disaster. (laughs) I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. I think I'm coming down with a little cold. I'm sorry if my voice sounds weird today. You can find all my old articles and podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 